It's a great pleasure and honor to be uh, invited to, to this event with uh, uh, illustrious uh, speakers. And I'm going to talk about some, what uh, I've, I've learned from my research and from that of some other people and try to give uh, a perspective. I, I want to start with a picture that uh, just restate what uh, uh, Justin Lin said before. Uh, it says that uh, uh, it's, it's hard not to call China's economic growth a miracle. Uh, this is a slightly different perspective. It shows that how China was as a share of the world GDP in 1980. Uh, China has a population that is uh, much larger than the European Union and the United States together, and yet it represented like 2.5% of the share of world GDP in 1980. Today, it's uh, about at the level of the United States uh, and uh, of the European Union in uh, uh, PPP adjusted uh, terms. Uh, it's, also, it's also clear that the, the, the economic miracle started in a particular point. Uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult to see exactly what happens. If you take India, for instance, it's not so clear uh, to see why India started growing and, and, and what forces were there. Well, here, uh, if you look at, in GDP per capita term relative to the US, you know, there are data issues, especially if you go back to the uh, early, before, earlier than the 1970s, but uh, Pan World Table or IMF, uh, uh, for instance, uh, would show clearly that there was not much convergence going on before uh, the economic reforms and that the convergence has been uh, very fast uh, thereafter. Now, I want to talk about uh, problems, not only about uh, uh, the great things uh, in, uh, uh, that happened in these last uh, 35 years uh, and uh, point at an issue that has been raised in one of the questions and also Justin Lin again uh, talk about it. So starting from 2011, 2012, economic growth in China has slowed down. Uh, it has not plunged. It, has, it is still uh, quite remarkable, 6.7%. Any uh, European country and many uh, developing countries would, would be very happy to grow at that, at that rate. But there are signs that uh, the economy is experiencing some difficulties that go beyond that number. Uh, we have had a, a reduction in TFP growth, uh, fall in the rate of return to investment that have remained very high. Uh, so, you know, if you take a standard model of economic growth and convergence, you, you should expect that the, the return to investment to fall over the, post, the process of convergence, but it has remained very high in China. In fact, at some point, for, for several years, it has been growing, Well, now it, it has declined. Uh, there is emergence of a large excess capacity in many sectors, you know, salmon, steel, etc. Uh, there have been also growing uh, element of apprehension for the financial stability. Uh, stock market turbulence, uh, stock market was uh, suspended uh, so many times uh, in recent years. Uh, the boom of private and public credit uh, uh, has also uh, created some, some, some comments. Now, on all of this, I want to say something maybe upfront. I'm always uh, uh, being in debate on the side of uh, those who do not believe in, uh, in a sudden collapse uh, of economic growth uh, in China. So maybe today I will take a little bit the other side and I will emphasize some potential, some potential problem. Um, let me uh, start, uh, let me go back again to one of the questions that was about uh, middle income traps. So there is some regularity. I would say, you know, statistical regularity here is not uh, as clean as one would like to see to say, you know, there's a sharp style of fact. But uh, a number of studies point at the difficulties that many economies have encountered in growing after reaching about 30% of the distance from the technological frontier in as measured by uh, productivity. Here I have selected a, a number of countries, mostly in terms of their economic significance. Uh, and uh, I'm reporting, uh, based uh, on a methodology suggesting a study from a, a team at the IMF. Uh, unfortunately, the citation uh, doesn't show completely, but uh, uh, you know, I'm reproducing methodologically something that I borrowed from other people. Uh, the the uh, point here is take uh, as t equal to zero, the year in which the GDP per capita relative to the US is the one that China had in 2007 and uh, project the economic growth over the, the following years. So, you know, the starting point is a different year for, for different countries. Now you see that there, are like, there is like a large group of countries that 
has not grown very fast. Many of these countries were growing fast before reaching that point already, you know, like Peru, Brazil, but uh, their, their economies did not perform well. Now, when, one can say it's a story about Latin America. Well, even countries like Malaysia or Thailand that grew faster than uh, uh, did uh, uh, Latin American countries have slowed down somehow. So there is an evidence of difficulty in going beyond this stage. There are also success stories, and uh, South Korea and Taiwan have already been mentioned. For China, it's still too early, but of course the question is, has China the right policy and institution to follow up on the successful path? So in this presentation, I want to do three things. First, I want to bring some analytical framework to understand uh, the process of economic development in a model of uh, technology convergence, of late camera advantage, as it was uh, described before, that builds on uh, my previous work with Darren Semoglu and Philippe Aguillon. So I will show you some international evidence on that. Then I want to talk about the engines of uh, what we call investment-led growth in China, and I want to talk about transition into innovation-led growth, that we argue to be important to sustain economic growth and success like in the case of Korea and Taiwan. And I will be specific about all these points. So what, is the, the, what are the building blocks of the theory? Well, the main idea is that in the process of economic uh, development, there are different engines uh, that uh, have different power at different stages of the development process. So far from the economic frontier, it's very important to mobilize resources to create the condition for capital accumulation, physical investment, uh, and uh, through this process of investment, the adoption of better technologies. So technologies that are already existing and have already been discovered elsewhere, but are not, not yet in use in the country, that becomes a powerful motive of uh, economic growth. So imitation, adoption, and simple adaptation of existing technology. There is a great potential of growth there. Reallocation is also a very important part of that process. So by the process of investment, think of the model of Arthur Lewis, for instance. Well, then, by creating capital accumulation, you also reallocate resources towards uh, more efficient uh, use. I argue in my earlier work that this has been very important in China. As you come closer to the economic frontier, however, the power of this, uh, you know, of this engine becomes uh, 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 more modest. Uh, you know, in particular, it becomes harder to just grow uh, by simple uh, adoption of technologies that already exist. Maybe you can still do it in some sectors, but in many sectors you have approached the, the technology frontier. Maybe there, there's still some gap, but the technology requires more substantial adaptation. So it's a continuous process, although what I will show you in the data, I will try to dichotomize for making the, the, the message sharper. But uh, what, what matters is that the main engine of uh, 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 of uh, 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 growth become the innovative capacity for firms and human capital that is uh, also a way to uh, uh, foster that. Now, different engines can be aided by different policies. So, I, uh, yesterday, again, uh, Justin gave a very nice uh, speech about uh, uh, you know, the failure of uh, star recipes like import substitution or just let the market do the job. Uh, I do believe that uh, governments are important and the policies that are put in place are important, but we emphasize that in the different stages of the process of development, different policies become more important. So in the investment-led growth stage, uh, policies often take the nature of supporting uh, large uh, uh, champions, you know. Some firms uh, become very important in promoting investment. It's not always so important that those firms are unchallenged. The important thing is to uh, alleviate coordination problems, overcome credit frictions, and uh, uh, exploit uh, uh, comparative advantages. So this is very important, uh, the capacity of uh, an economy to mobilize resources. When we enter uh, the stage of innovation-led growth, and again, this is a continuous process, but uh, uh, it becomes more important to create competition for, uh, uh, you know, fair competitiveness, perhaps, uh, I should call it, level playing field competition. So entry, churning, creative destruction, these are very important uh, uh, 
uh, factor in the economic growth of advanced economy and also of economies that are not uh, in all sectors at the frontier but that are coming coming closer. And I would argue that, <laughs> and the evidence I show in a moment uh, supports this, that the transition requires a change in uh, uh, institution. Financial development is also very important because, again, large uh, bank-based system can work well in funding uh, 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 you know, enterprises, uh, a limited number of enterprises, but funding startup projects and creating the condition for churning and new ideas to come in the form of new firms being created, well, that's not always done so well by large banks. So venture capital, private equity, and this type of form of, invest, of uh, uh, financial uh, development are, are important. Corruption is also an important part of the story. Corruption, you know, in some countries, means just uh, uh, you know, social waste, uh, some appropriation of rents that prevent economic development. But in many countries that uh, succeed, and China is an example, uh, high level of corruption goes go end in end with high economic growth. I would say because partly uh, corruption is a way of, uh, you know, a distorted way, if you want, of uh, dealing with an agency problem. So somehow uh, uh, giving special favor to a connected firm uh, may be sometimes better than not doing anything. However, uh, it's, uh, 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 this form of growth becomes more difficult when the economy needs a clean rule and level playing field competition. So corruption uh, should decrease and countries that succeed in the process of development uh, are not co countries with uh, high corruption. Uh, right, so uh, this is a su somehow summary uh, view of, the, uh, of what is, uh, you know, the story in a, in a, in a diagrammatic way. Uh, think of this as uh, 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 this uh, proximity to the frontier, so TFP relative to the frontier, and imagine this uh, 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 China in the 1990 being sufficiently far that investment-led growth was very powerful. Well, China today might have come over the point where innovation-led growth becomes more important. And note uh, the, the structure of this graph, it suggests that although investment-led growth may be more successful in achieving growth at early stages, at some point it may actually lead the country to stop converging. Uh, you see that red point is a situation where the country uh, gets stuck. It doesn't, it's, it's not that it stops growing, but it grows at the same speed as the frontier, and so there is no further convergence. That's the version in our theory of what people call sometimes middle-income traps. Um, empirically, there should be some regularity that uh, relates, uh, you know, if I, if I classify economies into uh, innovation-led uh, growing economy or investment-led growing economy with uh, the respective institution, well, at the early stages of development, investment-led growth can lead to higher growth rate, but the interesting thing is that it, it declines faster, so it has a higher slope. I'm going to show you uh, a few graphs that show exactly this pattern, okay? So I'm going to look at two measures of uh, what I call support to insiders, so the type of policies that I associate with the investment-led growth mode. I'm going to look at measures of barriers to entry, and I'm also going to look at a uh, measure of uh, uh, corruption. Um, and, and then I'm showing you also a graph where I focus on a measure of innovation, so the uh, uh, our investment in R&D as a percentage of GDP. The graph I'm showing you are only on non-OECD countries, because I think this theory especially applies to uh, converging economies, not to frontier economies, but if you include OECD countries, the results are, are there, uh, if anything, stronger. So, so here I'm using the uh, uh, number of procedures starting a business of the World Bank uh, in, in, for classifying uh, in high and low barriers, depending on where, on the average of the few years for which we have observation, uh, the country is above or below average. Now, the, the above panel, are, it's a pool, pool regression, and the below, it's a fixed effect regression. So the first uh, pulls information on cross-section and uh, time variation, you know, five years uh, interval. The latter controls for fixed effect, so it removes the average growth of the country. And what you can see is that in, in all cases, compare horizontally, high barriers, the relationship between proximity to the frontier and the growth rate tends to be more downward sloping. Don't look at the level because there is some normal, normalization involved, but if you compare, the, the, the regression line is always more downward sloping, and once we 
we filter out uh, counter-specific heterogeneity more so. So there is a tendency for, uh, if you look at the lower graph, for counters with higher barrier to suffer a stronger deterioration in their performance as they come closer to the economic uh, frontier. Uh, this is a graph similar to the one we had in the 2006 paper, but these are data until 2014 and so on, on, on a larger set of countries. So the results are, uh, if anything, stronger than those we had at the time. And similar results are, are, are found if you look at corruption. So if you look at countries with uh, uh, high corruption, their deterioration of the deterioration of their performance as you come closer to the frontier is faster than from countries with uh, low corruption. And this is uh, an index of R&D. You know, this, uh, this is uh, R&D over GDP. Again, splitting between high and low R&D countries, you see that there is a tendency of countries that do not invest in innovation to have a faster deterioration of the growth performance over the process of economic convergence. Now, I won't have time to take you through uh, regressions just to show you that uh, actually if you do the analysis uh, uh, you know, with, uh, with standard regression uh, techniques, uh, you know, we don't have uh, uh, very strong identification here. You can use the dynamic panels. Uh, you can use a more continuous specification rather than dichotomizing high and low growth. The results uh, are uh, robust for all the measures I, I told you. Okay, so, so this helps me introduce the case of China because I think that China is an example of a country that has done very well in promoting investment-led growth. So let me talk about the institutions of investment-led growth in China. Uh, interesting, uh, the, I, I came across this uh, recent paper by a team of Russian people who had studied industrialization in the Soviet Union before, and uh, they, I have learned something that uh, I, w I wouldn't have expected, that even in Mao time there was a, a substantial uh, degree of uh, uh, growth, uh, both in t total factor productivity and in uh, uh, capital accumulation. Uh, there was also, uh, bef at least after the, 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 uh, <coughs> the, the, the great... Um, uh, the, the great leap forward, there was also a high growth of the population, so this didn't lead to a large uh, convergence. And after 78, as we all know, everything went faster and better. So uh, the, there is, there, the interesting insight is that there was already some type of accumulation at, in, in, under in Mao regime, but uh, the, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the data, there is a significant acceleration of TFP growth, especially in non-agricultural sector, after uh, the, the, the death of uh, Chairman Mao. So here are the set of uh, factors that I regard as most important in determining the success of this uh, uh, investment-led growth in China. Certainly the agricultural reform and the collectivization that took place in the early 1980s. Industrial policy, I will show you later, uh, I will show you in a moment uh, some, the result of some recent work uh, I have done. Uh, reallocation, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, we argue in our previous uh, study, it was a very important and powerful mechanism, especially between the middle 1990s and the middle uh, 2000, the, first, the middle of the first decade of the, of the, of the, of the uh, uh, millennium. Uh, there was an improvement in the governance of the performance of surviving state of enterprise, so somehow we emphasize the importance of privatization. This paper by uh, Chang Taishe and Song Zhang uh, also showed that there was an improvement in the performance of surviving state-owned enterprises. There was a very important role of technology transfer, especially through uh, attraction of foreign direct investment, something that, for instance, a recent paper by Holmes, McGratton, and Prescott analyzes in uh, uh, Restart 2015. There was a new set of values and of uh, career incentives within the Communist Party of China, Several papers have studied there. I'm uh, uh, highlighting one, and I'm sure that many people here have also contributed to that. So rather than ideological loyalty, it was more based on uh, economic performance uh, uh, in the respective role. So this created a different system of, uh, of incentive. Um, a recent uh, paper that I, I think is very, very uh, useful and very informative by uh, uh, and Bai, who is here with Chen Song, talks about the, the uh, um, concomitance of local state capacity and selective support to firms, something I, I will have to say about that too. So let me mention uh, first my uh, uh, work on uh, uh, spatial economic zones together with Simon Alder and Lin Shao. So spatial economic zones have been a centerpiece of China's industrial policy. 
These are place-based policy that entailed a combination of liberalization and discriminatory element. So there was, a, on the one hand, the experiencing with market economy, but also uh, creating a very uh, strong distortion in the uh, internal allocation of the resources in favor of the areas that were treated. So one of the goals was to attract uh, uh, knowledge through foreign direct investment and also to promote investment in manufacturing. So the two questions here are, did they create more development in the treated areas? And especially, did it, do it, did it happen at the expenses of uh, uh, neighboring regions? So it was just a mere transfer of resources, or was it really uh, an engine of uh, economic uh, development? Well, I guess this audience knows uh, very well the story. I usually have this uh, slideshow that gives you the idea that initially everything was in the East Coast, and then it moved progressively inside. Uh, and the nature of this uh, reform, since it was staggered over time, it allows us to exploit both the variation over time and over location, and we use a strategy similar to the one uh, I used in a paper with uh, Guillaume Burgess and Redding on industrial policy in, uh, uh, in India. Now, I think that perhaps the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the most important, the second most important part of the study is to check if, this, uh, if the effect, the differential effect of being uh, 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 located in, uh, of being the host of special economic zones was at expenses of neighboring regions, which is a standard criti criticism of this place-based policy. We just, they do better, but some other areas do worse. Okay, so we, are, we try to, to go to that. Well, let me show you first uh, what the, the nature of the effect is. These are kind of relatively well-identified effects. We can also see at what happened in the city, so, so you, you can see in the picture the time of the reform and what happens in every year after the reform. You see it's a, a gradual build up of differential effect over the, the first uh, 10 years. We also don't have significant effect, a little bit of positive effect before the reform, which suggests some selection. We try to do something, there is nothing perfect that one can do. Unfortunately, uh, uh, randomly allocated reform are very rare. Unfortunately, for, uh, for uh, the researcher, not uh, for the policymaker necessarily. Well, this, uh, uh, so this is uh, the effect. It's a 20% increase in level. It's not huge in a country that grows like China, but I think that uh, it's also interesting that there is a positive effect of investment on human capital and on total factor productivity. It's very robust, and there are large positive spillovers on neighboring cities. So, being close to a special economic zones being a city close to special economic zones improves the uh, uh, performance relative to areas that are far, far away from special economic zones, suggesting, if anything, that crowding in was more important than uh, crowding out. The second factor that I want to highlight, again, uh, uh, based on some work I did, is reallocation. So a large uh, uh, share of post-reform uh, Chinese growth is explained by reallocation. Part is the, the urbanization that accelerated. Uh, some studies surprisingly find that the contribution of this to overall growth is not huge. Uh, within the manufacturing sector, uh, uh, several studies, including ours, argued that this was very important. And this, this reallocation was mostly driven by privatization. So as you certainly know, until the 1990s, there was uh, uh, no uh, uh, privately owned firms or, or very few privately owned firms in, in China. It was from the middle of 1990s, and especially from the 15th Congress of the Communist Party of China, that private firms became, uh, became viable and uh, uh, actually they developed. If one looks at the data from the National Business Survey, one finds that uh, any measure you can look at, productivity, profitability, TFP, it's higher in private firms than in corresponding state-owned firms, controlling for industry at the very fine grid level. And this is the picture of the employment share of domestic private firms from 1998 till, till today. So you see that uh, although you know, there are issues about measurement because many firms are neither too fully private, neither fully uh, state-owned, if you put a threshold at different level, this is, uh, this is the qualitative picture that you observe. So in our uh, uh, growing like China, we argue that uh, this happened under the shadow of important financial frictions. So somehow the constraint for the growth of the private firms is that it is very difficult for private entrepreneurs in China to get uh, uh, access to, to financing. And interesting, the, the theory with this ongoing transition can also explain why <clears throat> growth rate of wages 
was uh, uh, low in a qualified way during this transition. In which qualified way? Well, wage growth in China was never low, but it was lower than productivity growth. So somehow this is our explanation for why the rate of return of investment continued to be high and in fact increased during the transition. The fact that in a sense less productive firm serves almost like a reserve of labor force uh, for the more productive firms by setting the wage at the productivity level uh, in those firms. So we can explain the fast output growth and also uh, something I won't have time to talk about, the emergence of a large uh, foreign imbalance. There is also you know, a kind of related paper by uh, Shen Song that I mentioned before that argued that in the moment in which the Chinese government forced the state of enterprise to compete among themselves and with the private enterprises, there is also an important selection effect among state-owned enterprises. Now, I should mention uh, uh, that this process of privatization uh, had many peculiar features. There is a, a paper by uh, Chong and Bai with uh, uh, Chang Taishe and Song Zhang that uh, actually studies this uh, in a very, from a very interesting perspective. So let's go back to the, uh, one of the measures I mentioned before, barriers to, uh, uh, barriers to entry. Actually, China, as they document, as a terrible, is terrible in terms of that formal measure. So it's, uh, uh, it takes a very long time to set up a firm, and it ranks at the level of an African, of, of some failed state in Africa, like the Democratic Republic of Congo. Well, this, uh, however, would be, it would be incorrect to take this measure and just say, well, it's very difficult to set up a business. In fact, uh, this is uh, paired with a very, uh, with, with, with a first with the process of decentralization and also with a strong local state capacity that uh, has uh, enabled local government to overcome formal frictions and to create strong incentive actually for firms to invest and to grow at the local level. Although this was not uh, a kind of standard uh, Washington consensus liberalization, it was more often the creation of local monopolies and these local monopolies uh, uh, were very powerful uh, engine of growth at the city level. The other uh, aspect that they emphasize is that there is competition across localities and also within organization of the state and of the Communist Party that uh, allows this uh, not to be a system of completely frozen monopoly, but you know, local monopoly, but competition across the cities. So you would have, for instance, uh, different uh, type of car being sold uh, to, as uh, taxis in different cities. So this uh, creation of rents and, at the same time, ability of, state, of local government to mobilize uh, resources was very important. In many other countries, uh, in, in many developing countries, the problem is that local government would just extract rents and not guarantee any uh, possibility of development to firms because they would know that another, another level of corruption would intervene and they would ask again rents. They, in that sense, uh, uh, the Chinese model worked uh, well. It was also a time in which economic growth was associated with a high level of uh, corruption. And so this tolerance for corruption somehow was uh, part uh, of, that, uh, of that model. Now, of course, this comes uh, under question, uh, for instance, uh, during the uh, uh, recent campaign of the uh, Chinese leadership. The question is, uh, you know, uh, what will happen, what alternative system of incentive will be in place if uh, corruption uh, is, uh, is repressed. So, and it's one of the questions that the authors uh, raise. So, uh, from the perspective of my talk, uh, uh, the question here is, uh, this system was very good at stimulating the, the investment, uh, at creating strong advantage position for connected firms. Uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, it's uh, good in terms of creating this uh, level playing field competition uh, environment that I was, uh, I was mentioning before. Uh, so high barriers, high corruption, you remember my pictures. That's not a predictor of uh, continuing growth. So my take is that more economic reforms are needed if China wants to continue to grow, to grow fast. Um, okay, let me talk, uh, let me skip uh, because I'm sure that Chong and Bai in his talk tomorrow will come on, on, uh, on this, you know, and dis discuss uh, the, the importance also of the recent uh, 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 Chinese uh, uh, economic stimulus package and how this uh, has created, uh, you know, a new, uh, you know, has reinforced even further 
uh, the, the path of investment-led growth. I want to talk instead uh, about some work that I'm doing recently, so this is work in progress, uh, that tries to address the following question. Is China making a transition that uh, we argue is important towards uh, a more innovation-led economy? If one looks uh, at the picture, well, if one looks at the statements, actually the, the leadership seems to be very, very concerned about this and argues that uh, uh, innovation should be promoted at, uh, uh, in all ways. But is it happening? Well, let me first look at an aggregate, at, at an aggregate figure. This is uh, the uh, R&D as, as a share of GDP in China compared with the number of industrialized economies. So if I compare China with the most uh, uh, middle-income economies, uh, emerging economies, China dwarfs uh, all of them because the typical level would be around 1%, which is where China was in the, in the late 1990s. China today spends uh, more than 2% of its GDP, uh, which is at the same average level as, as the European Union, but the European Union is, is, a, is a richer area of the world. So China is an outlier in this respect, and it spends more than the United Kingdom or, or Italy. Now, spending in R&D per se may not be the whole story, because you, know, you can start classifying as R&D something because uh, I get some guidelines, or I can uh, invest in unproductive R&D. So what we are trying to do is to understand where is all this R&D going, is it going in the productive direction? Is it creating uh, a new engine of growth? Or it's just, uh, you know, policy creates fun incentives. So in a recent paper with uh, 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 Koenig and uh, Lorenz, we take uh, the model of uh, uh, Asamoglu, Aguillon, Filibotti, and we bring it to the level of firm dynamics, and we show that uh, actually uh, if firms endogenously within each industry select themselves into imitating and innovating firm, you generate a distribution of uh, uh, productivity that matches uh, some empirical regularity. So, uh, you know, like other papers, we show that there is convergence to a Pareto distribution where the Pareto shape may be affected by uh, policy and by the incentive of firms to do imitation versus innovation. In the, in, in the ideal efficient economy, there is a simple threshold rule. The least efficient firms uh, don't innovate because for them it's optimal to, to just uh, copy from existing firm, which is modeled as a random sample from, uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, the set of firms, whereas the more productive firms actually push the frontier or the Chinese frontier in this case. However, if in this economy you introduce a series of wedges, of distortions, well then you scramble this uh, allocation. So according to our theory, the, 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 lower, the higher the correlation between productivity and investment in R&D, the more productive is investment in R&D. Do we see such a correlation in China? The first question we ask. The, the answer is yes. If you run, and this is a, a regression at, uh, uh, on, on uh, you know, four, uh, a balanced panel of 424,000 uh, uh, firms, where uh, you know, the dependent variable is uh, the extensive margin of, of R&D that we take as a proxy of inv innovative investment. Uh, this is just extensive margin. The, the intensive margin has a similar, a similar feature. So if you look at uh, the correlation between the level of total factor productivity controlling for industry dummies at a very fine grid, grid level, so three or even four digits, the results the result are very robust. Well, we see that on average it is the more productive TF, uh, uh, firms that do R&D, uh, it is true also, uh, here we have data for 2001 and 2007, if you control for firm six effect. And these effects are also quantitatively uh, uh, sizable. It's also true that there is a, a clear and strong advantage of state-owned enterprises. So everything else being equal, state-owned enterprises do more R&D. That suggests that uh, there might be still some misallocation. In fact, it's true even con controlling for wedges in the capital markets, which means that we know that those already are smaller for SOE. There is yet something else that uh, favors state-owned enterprises. Do we see this uh, misallocation becoming larger or smaller over time? Let me just show you a picture with the sake of not keeping uh, my, my intervention too long. Well, this is if you compare 2001 with 2007, uh, red uh, uh, solid is firms that do R&D, 
and Dash Blue is firms that do not do R&D. Uh, in the 2001, there is some positive sorting of the firms that do R&D, but in 2007, it is much stronger. So it, and, and also, if you, look, uh, if you do an analysis specifically on the switchers, firms that start doing R&D, you see the same. So there seems to be a tendency of the allocation of R&D to go in the right direction. Is it true that uh, firms that do R&D grow more in the years to come? Yes, it is. It is true in 2001, it is true in, two, in 2007. So this picture so, uh, uh, shows you firms sorted by percentile of uh, total factor productivity. So the more to the right you are, the more productive is the firm. And then it compares the growth rate, the annual TFP growth of firms that do and that do not do R&D. Okay? Do R&D uh, being the red. In 2001, it's uh, positive. In 2007, actually, on average, it's even larger. So 2000, doing TFP uh, in 2007 is a strong predictor of, doing, uh, of growing more in, in, in total factor productivity from 2017 to 2012. More so, and especially so, for high productivity firms. Again, this is consistent with our theoretical uh, uh, framework. Now, qualitatively and also in terms of size, that seems to be a, an optimistic uh, picture. Note that people have looked at uh, patents, for instance, and have found very mixed results. It looks that you know, the conclusion on the patent literature tends to be that, oh, patent is a big mess. We don't know if it has anything to do with innovation. R&D seems to have, at the firm level, to do with innovation. How does China compare with a success story? I take Taiwan. And uh, following uh, Justin's uh, uh, suggestion, I should not look at Taiwan today. I should look at Taiwan a few years back. In fact, I should look at Taiwan in the 1970s, but I don't have the data. I can look at Taiwan between 1988 and, uh, uh, 1988 and 1993, and what I find is the following. First of all, there is more sorting in Taiwan by TFP than in China. Okay? So these are... Uh, in China, you see in blue the 2001, and in red, 2007. S positive sorting means uh, positively sloped uh, 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 shape here. So you see in 2007 in particular, there is positive sorting, but in Taiwan, it's much stronger. In t Taiwan, it's much more true that it's the most productive firms that do R&D. That suggests that there is like, more scrambling of incentives in China today than in, or at least in 2001, 2007, than in Taiwan in the earlier days. If you also look at how important the effect of uh, uh, R&D on growth at the firm level is in China today versus in Taiwan earlier on, well, again, the effect is much larger in Taiwan than in China. And this perhaps is better seen uh, at, with the regression. You see the regression for China, the regression of Taiwan, there are all the standard controls, and it's on TFP on, on a dummy for R&D. Here, here the dependent variable is, is the growth rate of TFP at the firm level. So you see that in both China and in Taiwan, the growth rate uh, is positively associated with doing R&D, but the coefficient for Taiwanese firm is much larger. And moreover, much more dependent on whether firms uh, are high TFP firms. So according to the lens of our model, uh, we now want to feed and do some structural estimation. Well, China is moving in an innovation-driven direction, but not yet close to the level uh, of success of Taiwan. Okay? So I think uh, I should uh, uh, come to a conclusion. This is a summary of what I just said. And rather than uh, summarizing this uh, result for R&D, let me take stock on what I see uh, uh, you know, today China and in a future perspective. First of all, well, I think that growth in China is uh, set to slow down. I believe in economic theory. I think that uh, you know, there is a, still a great potential for China to catch up. Uh, but any model would uh, suggest uh, that China would uh, uh, slow down. Actually, we also made uh, some forecasts. This is a paper uh, published in AJ, AJ Journal, a, a American Economic Journal, MACOR, 2015. And there you see that you know, if China grows at a rate uh, of 5% between now and uh, 2025, still its catch-up is going to be very important, so very significant. So I would say that part of this uh, is... Uh, uh, is uh, physiological, 
But the slowdown, <coughs> the, the speed of the slowdown may be very different if China makes or does not make uh, uh, economic reforms. Uh, I think that what China needs is more financial liberalization and financial development. The, the leadership has taken some steps, but still I think there is a lot more to do. Uh, better investor protection. The lack of a truly independent judicial system. This is one of the big issues, and uh, a big issue also with the political system of China. So it has to be tackled, and uh, it's a difficult node. Uh, lowering the formal barriers and creating more market incentive and less incentive related to, uh, to connection. Um, I also think that uh, the Chinese government and the Chinese leadership should be wary of uh, an obsession for high figure. There is a part of the decline in the growth rate that we observe now, and I agree on this with, with Justin, that has uh, uh, you know, the nature of, of a temporary uh, uh, shock, so it's a temporary slowdown. But in this, this is the moment where the reforms are needed. Keeping investing and accepting a decline in the rate of return in order to uh, keep the growth rate high and uh, you know, continuing to pump in investment may actually go in the wrong direction relative to what I see is the necessary path of uh, uh, supply-side reform. Sometimes this term is used in the debate in a way different from what I mean, which is this set of uh, policies that I mentioned. So, so the adjustment, maybe also the reduction in the overcapacity, but especially the structural reform that turns the, that modernized economy and makes it more suitable to uh, innovation-led growth is more important. Well, as uh, someone living in the West, I cannot uh, resist uh, asking the last question. Not, uh, you know, I don't have the, the time and probably not even the knowledge, and we don't, maybe we'll have something to say. Uh, can the current non-democratic institutions sustain convergence to high income? Well, sometimes people talk about uh, Singapore. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, to what extent a small country like Singapore can represent a role model uh, for China? Uh, I think that the demands uh, uh, from uh, more uh, uh, freedom uh, will come, uh, will come increasingly so, and uh, possibly not resolving those type of, co of uh, uh, issues may actually have a, a negative effect uh, on the future uh, economic uh, uh, growth uh, of China. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Tiribodi, for a very insightful speech, and I have learned a lot. So now let's uh, take some questions from the audience. Yeah, please. Thank you very much. I just want to make two comments. The first one is, uh, well, a gray, uh, China's R&D spending has been increasing dramatically in recent years. but. Quality-wise, it's a very different issue. Uh, I can mention two points. One, if we look at the patterns, the invention pattern, the share of invention patterns has been declining in China in recent years, while R&D expenditure is increasing. The second point, uh, spending on basic and applied research as a proportion of R&D has been de declining as two. So it's two. R&D expenditure is increasing, but relatively spending on invention patterns, on basic and applied research has been declining in China. My second point relates to, I agree with you on the uh, investment in human capital. I think that I was going to ask Justin the question about this. There is room for investment, for more investment, but China should change the direction of investment. Investment in more in hospitals, in education, rather than in infrastructure. Thank you. Yes, so both are very important points. On the first one, I, my reading of the literature, well, actually, we want to match our data with the patents. We have not yet done it yet. But my reading of the literature is that the data on patents are not very telling in China, because the system of incentive is creating, uh, uh, you know, what we see is a very limited evidence that patent 
relates to future productivity growth, and R&D instead appears to relate. So it could well be, I speculate here, that uh, you know, there has been a correction in that system of incentive and we see patents going down. That would not be my first concern. On the second point, uh, I actually had the section of human capital, but I knew that uh, my presentation here should not be too long. I think this is a very important uh, uh, aspect of uh, what's coming. It also comes in connection with the demographic trends. You know, we have a, a big issue of demographic transition in China, and many people say, oh, this is going to kill growth in China. We have studied that issue and also the, the projection about future growth that we have produced are based on that. And it is a, a very, there is a very important and salient effect of the quality of uh, people entering the labor force. And actually, if you look at uh, over a long uh, uh, period, there has been a significant increase in uh, uh, the skill premium, uh, in uh, the educational premium in China for, for, for a long time until recently. And I think that that shows uh, the kind of need that the economy has of more uh, skills. Now, in recent years, this uh, is uh, somehow challenging. There is some evidence that Chong and Bai has that shows that actually it has been reversed. And I think that uh, uh, this might be one of the side effects on an excessive reliance uh, on investment and on sectors that uh, do not uh, uh, require uh, those skills. So I think that uh, it's a necessary condition for what I hope will happen in China, but China must also put in place additional institutions to fully capitalize on this uh, more educated uh, uh, labor force. The numbers are, are huge. So, you know, the change in educational attainment, the number of uh, Chinese people studying abroad, many people here are counted there, is, is, uh, is uh, amazing. Okay, thank you. Is there any other questions? Oh, please. We have a... Uh, thank you for your presentation, Maximilian Piekut from University of Warsaw. Uh, there was a part of presentation that you skipped because you didn't have time to explain. That was one point that I was especially interested in. Um, it was wrote that uh, grasp the large firms, let the small ones go. Uh, one of the motives of uh, CCP Congress, I believe, ni 97. And coming from a country which 70% GDP is produced by small and middle uh, enterprises. I was wondering uh, what was the motive and what were the implications of such poli policy? Thank you. Mm. Okay, that, that, that slogan refers to state-owned enterprises. So at that point, the, the view that prevailed, before then, essentially, all enterprises were for, for life. They were supposed to stay there, irrespective of their performance. Uh, that uh, Congress of the Communist Party pushed the view that only the more uh, efficient and possibly the largest uh, among the state-owned enterprises uh, would uh, have to be somehow protected or continue to, to, to be in existence, and other, other firms uh, should uh, be let uh, uh, go to their, to their destiny. So in some way, this was a way of summarizing a type of selective uh, pro-market uh, reforms. Now, having uh, what you say that you know, the importance of small and medium enterprises, uh, I'm not uh, certainly arguing that these were not important. Actually, according to our data, those very important uh, in, the, in, the, in the process of reallocation. So new firms, uh, new private firms were a very important driver of economic growth. If anything, the problem is that the more successful of these firms should grow even larger than they do today. So this is, uh, for instance, clear in the study by Shane Klino. Uh, in China and in India, it's very difficult for very productive firms to succeed to become large. Uh, but that's uh, somehow related to the uh, situation of uh, the credit uh, market constraints. So, uh, the, the smallness uh, uh, is uh, sometimes the result of some uh, market failure. Okay, thank you. So we will take one last question. Yeah, please, this lady. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for uh, excellent presentation. I have a very brief question about, uh, I completely agree with you, China is a lies successful than other developed countries uh, to make an uh, innovative economy to drive economic development. And also I, I agree with you, 
the innovation is, is should be and need to be and have to promote it to stimulate uh, the economic development in future and particularly in China's 35 year plan, Chinese central government very clearly to point out the innovation economy. Uh, we need to make every effort to promote innovation economy, research and development to stimulate uh, the next five and next uh, 20 years economic growth. You also point out uh, Chinese economy right now is perfect in transition period. During transition period, economic uh, um, uh, development requires institution change. So from both domestic institution system and international system for innovation development, how do you think uh, we should promote or to make uh, advanced policies to stimulate uh, innovation economy to play significant role to stimulate, to stimulate economic uh, growth? Thank you so much. Yes. So first of all, I, I, my picture is not uh, somehow bleak for China. It shows that actually market forces uh, uh, appear to, to direct uh, this uh, uh, R&D effort, although uh, you know, in, a science, in, a, in, a, in an imperfect way. So I would say that uh, China has been uh, successful in mobilizing resources and creating you know, condition, like some of the special economic zones, for instance, were especially targeted to attracting technology, the creation of science parks, uh, and all everything that con concerns infrastructure appears to uh, have, have been done, or at least be, uh, is being done in the right way. I think that uh, there is more need of uh, microstructural reforms. I was mentioning, for instance, the financial development and investors' protection. Uh, I think, uh, to some level, culturally, one should abandon the idea that, well, we have to give guidelines uh, and maybe monetary incentive and let uh, somehow more market forces uh, uh, guide that, uh, that, that process and make sure that uh, uh, existing uh, monopoly, uh, implicit or explicit, do not choke off uh, the growth uh, of new startup firms. So I would say it's not only a matter of mobilizing resources once again, but it's a matter of creating uh, uh, market, uh, uh, market forces.